Keep yourself neat and tidy at all times, father said, and learn your duties. Read a portion of the Holy Scriptures every night before retiring, mother instructed, and father nodded his agreement. Harriet waved to them from the coach window, more than a little frightened, if the truth be told, for this was the first time she had been away from home and she was going into an unknown future. The coachman whipped up his horses. The guard blew a blast on his horn, and they were away, drawing clear of the village, leaving the happy years of childhood behind. "'You look distressed, my dear,' a kindly-looking matron on the opposite seat said. "'You are leaving home for the first time?' Harriet nodded while patting her eyes with a nice clean handkerchief, freshly laundered by mother that morning. Never mind, the good lady consoled. You'll soon get used to your new surroundings. It's good for youngsters to break away from the apron strings. Going into service, I expect. Yes, ma'am, Harriet nodded again. Begging your pardon, but how did you know? The lady laughed. Can always tell. Fresh young thing like you, all done up in your Sunday best. Service, I said to myself, the minute you put your foot inside this coach. The four other passengers had been listening to this conversation with varying degrees of interest, and one young man, who wore a beautiful waistcoat, smiled a rather supercilious smile. And what household is to be honoured by your service? Buckingham Palace? Oh no, Harriet gasped. "'But I am going to a nobleman's house, Lord Dunwilliams.' "'Are you, indeed?' The young man produced a quizzing glass and examined Harriet carefully for a few minutes, as though she were some rare specimen he had not encountered before. At length he dropped the glass which dangled on the end of a gold chain and pronounced his verdict. "'You should fit into Dunwilliams's establishment very nicely,' he said. "'Very nicely, indeed.' Harriet stood in the courtyard of the Royal George and watched the departing mail-coach rumble its way up a slope and out on to the main highway. The last link with home had been broken and she was now alone, subject to the caprice of total strangers. She sat down on her black box, not daring to enter the inn, for father had often stressed the evil which lurked in such places, and wondered what she should do. Father had said someone would be waiting to meet her— but so far none of the loungers that were clustered round the inn door advanced to claim her. Presently, however, a tall, dark man, dressed in a cassock, entered the courtyard. His coming seemed to alarm every one in sight, for they dispersed, scattering like corn-husks before the wind. Harriet saw the priest had a long, harsh face, a visage she knew to be right and proper for a man of his calling, and she got quickly to her feet, performing a little bob, thus displaying a seemly respect for the cloth and a sense of righteous humility. The reverend gentleman interrupted his journey towards the inn, which, if his expression was any criterion, boded ill for its occupants, and scowled down at the girl. "'And pray, child, what is a girl who displays all the outward signs of a proper upbringing doing in this place of iniquity? And unattended, eh?' He barked the A with such ferocity that Harriet trembled before bowing her knee into another bob, an action her mother had often stressed was most pleasing to the quality. "'If you please, sir, I am waiting to be picked up.' "'What?' The roar made Harriet realise she had not perhaps chosen her words well, and she hastened to explain. "'Begging your pardon, sir, but someone is to collect me. I am to be kitchen-maid.' "'if it so please you, at Dunwilliam Grange.' "'Repeat,' the priest said, his jaw muscles quivering. "'I say, if you have the brazen effrontery, "'repeat what you have just said.' "'If you please, sir, I am to be kitchen-maid at—' "'Yes, go on. Where, child, where?' "'Dunwilliam Grange, sir.' "'One hand seized the front of her dress.' The other tilted her chin, and the raucous voice rang out. "'The face is fair, eh? I grant you the devil has grown cunning and now hides his evil under a pretty, nay, even an innocent mask, but I am not deceived, eh? The form is shapely, well calculated to inflame men's senses, but I warrant that somewhere the great beast has left his mark, eh? Tell me, wench, where is it?' "'I don't know what you mean, sir.' 
Harriet dared not struggle, for she saw the reverend gentleman was sore afflicted. Saliva was trickling down the corners of his mouth, and his eyes were dreadfully bloodshot. She recalled that Gaffer Cheeseman had a similar appearance after he had drunk two gallons of cider on an empty stomach. The priest tightened his grip. Not know what I mean, eh? Going to Dun William Grange and pleading the innocence of a lamb that has just seen the light of day? I would as lief believe the sun rose at midnight and the devil bathed in holy water. Now I ask again, girl, where is the mark? The secret tit from which the beast takes substance. I have no mark, sir, Harriet was crying. When you have slept, I am certain you will regret abusing me so. My father says cider breeds madness. The roar of rage was like that of Farmer Giles's boar when it spotted Mistress Jarvie crossing the field in a red cloak. The priest spun her round and, gripping her dress at the neckline, ripped it open to the waist. Harriet felt the cold air on her back, and she pulled away, only to have her hair grabbed. The now spluttering voice shouted, "'The flesh is white, eh? So is the leper that is cast out from the haunts of men. But I will find the mark, eh? I will find it. Enough!' A sharp voice cut across the priest's tirade like the blade of a knife, and Harriet was suddenly released, to go sprawling face down on the cobblestones, where she lay sobbing for a few moments, then, remembering her half-nude state, scrambled to her feet. A man was just dismounting from his horse and tossing the reins to a nearby ostler. He sauntered over to the sobbing girl and glaring priest. Harriet, despite her distress, thought she had never seen such a beautiful gentleman before. He was tall, with a lean, bronzed face and a pair of dark, penetrating eyes. His hair was jet black, save for a single white streak which ran from the centre of his high forehead to the base of his skull. He was dressed all in black, relieved only by the silver trimmings on his cloak. He smiled, revealing even white teeth. I admire your taste, parson. But in public? Whatever would the dear bishop say? The clergyman crossed himself, then backed away a few paces. Avaunt, Satan! The gentleman laughed. I will be gone when the mood suits me. I will not ask why you molested this pretty creature, for you are as crazed as a cracked jug, and I have not the time for the prattle of a madman. Where were you bound, girl? Harriet would have dropped a curtsy, but she suspected such an operation might cause her to release her torn dress, so she meekly bowed her head instead. To Don William Grange, if it so please you, sir. Another of your imported devil spawn, the priest growled, and the gentleman raised his hand in mock horror. "'You malign me. I rarely snatch from the cradle. But I grant you she is a delicious morsel. What post are you to fill in my house, child?' "'You are Lord Dunwilliam,' she gasped. He sighed deeply. "'I fear so.' "'I am to be your kitchen-maid, my lord.' "'Indeed. I was not aware that we needed one.' It must be you that Rogue Hackett was supposed to collect, but he ran the dog-cart into a ditch. Drunk as a priest at a bishop's convention, he made an ironic bow in the parson's direction. Your pardon, Mr. Dale, I forgot. You prefer stripping girls to opening a bottle. The day of reckoning is coming, the Reverend Dale shook his fist. I know of the obscenities that take place in that proud house, but I tell you the time will come when its stones will be levelled to the ground. You'd best ride before me, girl, Lord Dunwilliam smiled down at Harriet. T'would not be wise to leave you here with that poor mad fool, and heaven above knows when Hackett will be sober enough to drive a cart. He beckoned to the ostler. Take the girl's box into the inn. Someone will call for it later. He mounted the great horse, then, leaning down, pulled Harriet up. She sat side-saddle, trying hard not to lean against him, and very mindful of the strong arms that railed her in on either side when he took up the reins. They rode out of the courtyard, and the Reverend Dale's voice followed them. God is not mocked. 
He will send forth his legions, and they will crush the forces of evil. Cursed be ye that walk by night, for darkness will be your lot for all eternity. The home of my fathers, said Dun William in a low tone. See, girl, the nest in which I was hatched. The grey-stoned house stood before a screen of trees, turreted, a face with many eyes. It was a structure of rare, if somewhat grim, beauty. Harriet wondered if she dare enter such a grand place with a torn dress and a dirty face. "'It's very nice,' she said. Lord Dunwilliam chuckled. "'I doubt if there are many hereabouts who would agree with that description. "'How in the name of sanity did you ever become engaged as my kitchen-maid? "'Mother, who was in service before she married, wrote to an agency in London, "'for she knows her letters and writes as good a hand as Parson himself. "'They sent someone down to see me, and I am to be on a month's trial.' Mm. "'his lordship grunted as they rode down one hill and then up another, "'finally to pass through the great iron gates of Dunwilliam Grange. "'Mrs. Browning was a woman of large proportions "'and such a grim aspect that Harriet almost wished herself back in the inn courtyard "'facing the Reverend Dale. "'The housekeeper allowed her cold gaze to travel slowly down from the girl's auburn head "'to the tips of her laced-up boots. "'How are you called, girl?' "'Harriet, ma'am.' "'Most unsuitable. "'From now on you will be known as Jane,' "'she called abruptly over one shoulder. "'Mary, come here.' "'An extremely pretty girl left the kitchen table "'where she had been slicing potatoes "'and came quickly over to Mrs. Browning, "'before whom she stood motionless, her head bowed. "'Yes, ma'am. "'Mary, you will take Jane upstairs "'and see that she returns suitably attired. "'She is to share your room.' "'Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Harriet followed her guide up some very steep and winding stairs, and presently came to a small room that overlooked the back garden. It was furnished with two narrow beds, a washstand, and a large cupboard. Mary was brimful with curiosity, and scarcely had she closed the door when questions came tripping off her tongue. "'How did your dress get all tore like that? And Jem the gardener says you come here on his lordship's horse. Did he tear your dress?' "'No.' Harriet shook her auburn curls. It was a horrible old parson. Ah, the Reverend Dale. He hates this place something cruel, and says all of us who live here be limbs of Satan. Why? Harriet had removed her tattered dress, which she was examining rather ruefully, and Mary opened the cupboard door and produced a black skirt and white blouse. Well, they do say all sorts of weird goings-on took place in this house back in his lordship's father's time, "'There's a big room, right up under the roof, "'and people saw flashes of light and heard terrible cries. "'Then one morning his old lordship was found dead. "'Twas said he took poison or some such thing. "'How awful!' Harriet shuddered. "'Aren't you frightened?' Mary shook her head. "'No, I pay no heed to talk like that. "'Only I wouldn't care to go wandering around the upper story after nightfall. "'Besides, the pay's good.' "'and although Mrs. Browning is a tartar, the work ain't all that hard.' "'While they had been talking, Harriet had dressed, "'and now she wore a costume corresponding to Mary's, "'a long black serge shirt and an off-the-shoulder blouse. "'She was not happy with this last item, "'mother having on more than one occasion "'stated that the face and hands "'were the only parts of the body a respectable woman "'bared for the public gaze. "'It don't seem right,' she began, but Mary laughed. "'You'll soon get used to it. "'Tis only the shoulders. "'Why, some ladies leave three parts of their boobs bare "'and aren't thought none the worse. "'It's the fad of her ladyships. "'Indoors we young uns have to wear this get-up. "'Don't do no harm, but it makes the parson owl. "'She laid Harriet's torn dress out on the bed and sighed. "'Shame, but a needle and thread should soon put it to rights. "'Now we best get down, or Mrs. Browning will be raising old Cain.' "'and her tongue be sharp enough as it is.' "'Back in the kitchen, Mrs. Browning gave Harriet a quick glance, then said, "'There's an overall hanging up behind the door. "'Put it on, then go into the scullery and start cleaning out the saucepans. "'We're all behind like a donkey's tail.' "'During the days that followed, Harriet began to realise to some degree "'why the Reverend Dale entertained such pronounced misgivings "'about the household at Dunwilliam Grange.' With the exception of Mrs. Browning, all the female staff were young and extremely pretty. 
another disquieting piece of information was that few completed their month's probation. The turnover in female staff was alarmingly high. Once, when washing up in the scullery, she heard Jem the head gardener and Hackett, a bearded morose individual, talking as they sat drinking beer at the kitchen table. That new one be shapely. "'Twould be a good tumble in the A. Harriet wondered what this remark might mean, but, realising that she was the new one under discussion, wiped her hands dry and stood listening. "'Won't last long,' Hackett stated. "'They never does. After a little chat with her ladyship, out they goes.' "'That be a strange thing,' Jem refilled his glass from an earthenware jug. "'Why be that?' right as a trivet, until they has a little heart-to-heart -heart with her ladyship. The number of boxes and blubber and wenches you've driven down to the Royal George, don't they talk right or summat? Maybe, Hackett murmured gruffly. Maybe. There was a full minute's silence, and Harriet wondered if the conversation had come to an unsatisfactory conclusion. Then Hackett spoke again but this in a low, though perfectly audible, tone. Jem, if I tells you summat confidential-like, will you promise to keep it under your hat? I'll be as silent as the grave, Jem promised. I'm not one to blab, you knows that. Well, Hackett said and cleared his throat. Perhaps I shouldn't tell you, as his lordship gave me a gold piece to keep me mouth shut, but it's laying on me conscience, and I'd like to unburden, if you knows what I mean. Aye, man, go on with it. Well, about two years back, do you remember that red-headed piece, Clara? Only her real name was Jenny Binns. Well, she went upstairs for a little chat with her ladyship. Excited she was, thought maybe she'd get promotion to above stairs, and I didn't tell her no different. It must have been about half past six when his lordship comes over to the coach house. Looked a bit down in the mouth, he did. He says, Hackett, Clara's been taken ill. I want you to take her to the good sister, he says. I'll ride over and see the mother superior. Well, I thought that a bit funny, see. Any road, I went up to her ladyship's room. And there was the girl looking as if she had a fit. Speechless she was, with her face all twisted up, and her eyes. Struth. You'd think she'd seen old Nick himself. Do you think that maybe? Jem asked in a low, quivering voice. She had? No, man, I don't know with that nonsense. But I tell you somewhere else. There were three ruddy great scratches down her back. No, Jem gasped. You're having me on. True as I sit here. Her blouse was all tore, and scratches like claw marks down her back. Don't know what they thought of it up at the convent. Mad dog, mayhap. Anyway, her ladyship was furious. Kept muttering about her almost being the one. "'What do you think she meant?' Jem asked. "'God knows. "'But, no word, mind, here comes old Ma Browning.' "'Harriet went back to her washing up, "'trying to understand what the conversation had implied. "'Above all, what sort of person was Lady Dunwilliam? "'Mary, have you seen Lady Dunwilliam yet? "'Once or twice?' Mary was bathing her feet in an earthenware bowl. She walks in the small garden sometimes. Why? I just wondered. You haven't been up to see her? Oh, I see what you mean. Mary wiped her feet on a towel. Then, opening the window, emptied the contents of the bowl onto the garden below. That'll make the cabbages grow. No, Mrs. Browning said her ladyship would want a few words with me some time, but nothing's happened yet. Mary climbed into bed and blew out the candle before snuggling deep into the feather mattress. She grunted with complete satisfaction. Never slept on a feather mattress till I came here. Do you proud they do? What's she like? Harriet asked. Who? 
Lady Don William. Oh, I've never spoken to her. She's got a lovely face. But she's deformed. Deformed? Yes. Mary turned over, making her bed creak. She's got a lump. Terrible it is. A great bulge that comes up to her shoulders. i never seen anything like it. We had a hunchback in our village, Harriet said, and the boys used to poke fun at him. He was a nasty man who beat his donkey. If you poked fun at Lady Dunwilliam, Mrs. Browning would most likely beat you. Now go to sleep, do. We've got to be up early tomorrow. The following morning Mrs. Browning summoned Harriet from the scullery and handed her a stiff brush and dustpan. Nora is down with the flux. You must stand in for her. Get upstairs to the first landing and brush the carpet. Don't make a mess. Harriet took the dustpan and brush, and not without some trepidation, for she had never been in the upper part of the house before, made her way upstairs. Lord Dunwilliam had been kind when he had rescued her from the clutches of the Reverend Dale, but she instinctively knew it was the kindness he would have bestowed on a tormented dog had the mood so moved him. Her parents had taught her to fear and respect people of quality, and fear was uppermost as she mounted the grand staircase. The carpet was thick, her feet sank into the soft pile, and she was trying hard to look in all directions at once. Massive gilt-framed pictures lined the walls. A magnificent chandelier was suspended from a high ceiling that dominated both staircase and hall. A footman, resplendent in a plum-coloured brocade livery and powdered wig, minced his way across the first landing and stared at her with supercilious scorn. "'What are you doing up here, girl?' "'I am here to clean the carpet,' Harriet raised her head, not in the least impressed by brocade or wig, knowing the man's status to be little above her own. "'Then get on with it,' he instructed, "'and don't make any noise. Her ladyship is still asleep.' She poked her tongue out at his retreating figure, then sank to her knees and began to brush the carpet. In fact, it needed little attention, and she found the work pleasant after weeks of washing up, scrubbing the kitchen floor, and other menial tasks. She reached the centre of the landing when a quiet voice asked, "'Who are you?' Harriet was afraid to look up. The voice was low and had that well-bred quality which told her it was one of authority. It spoke again. Stand up, girl, when I am speaking to you. Harriet laid aside her dustpan and brush, then obeyed to find herself facing the most beautiful woman she had ever seen. I am Lady Dunwilliam. If she had said she was the Queen of England, Harriet would have felt no surprise, for the lovely fair-skinned face was regal, even arrogant. A mass of waving, ash-blonde hair tumbled down to her shoulders, a glorious cascade that Harriet wanted to touch. Her eyes were possibly the most outstanding feature, for they were dark brown and contrasted dramatically with her dazzling fairness. But all this beauty was ruined by the grotesque hump that swelled out in a gradual curve from the small of her back to just above her shoulders. The weight or perhaps the ungainly bulk of this awful deformity, made it impossible for Lady Dunwilliam to stand upright. And she stooped, reminding Harriet of the coal-man preparing to empty his sack into father's cellar. The dark, wonderful eyes were bitter, and lines of suffering were etched round the full mouth. "'It would seem you are deaf,' Lady Dunwilliam said. "'I asked who you were.' "'Harriet!' "'I mean, Jane, my lady, the kitchen-maid, if it please you.' "'It does not please me,' the cold voice stated. "'I am at a loss to know what the kitchen-maid is doing up on this landing. "'Surely you should be scouring pots or something.' "'Nora, the housemaid, is ill, and Mrs. Browning said. "'Never mind.' "'A long-fingered hand waved aside the explanation.' as a spasm of pain passed over the lovely face. "'Leave off doing whatever you're supposed to be doing, and come with me.' She turned quickly and led the way into the bedroom. Harriet followed and found herself in a charming blue room that was in a state of chaos. 
Articles of clothing littered the floor, were draped over chair backs and even the dressing table. The bed was unmade, the sheets and blankets were twisted up, and one pillow was ripped open. A great gaping wound from which feathers seeped like maggots from the belly of a dead horse. Clear this lot up, Lady Dunwilliam ordered, then sank down onto a dressing stool. From where she watched the girl with sombre eyes, Harriet began to collect the clothes together, piling them on a chair. How long have you been here? Lady Dunwilliam asked. A week, my lady. You can drop the ladyship business. Ma'am will suffice. Yes, my... Yes, ma'am. An uncomfortable silence prevailed for some five minutes before Lady Dunwilliam spoke again. Do you like working in the kitchen? Harriet thought it good policy to express satisfaction with her mode of employment. Oh, yes, ma'am. Then you must be either mad or stupid, and you appear to be neither. Her ladyship spoke sharply, and Harriet shivered, scarring saucepans, scrubbing floors, being bullied by the excellent Mrs. Browning. I am sure you must enjoy that. Harriet did not answer, but turned her attention to the bed, which she proceeded to strip before kneading the mattress. As she leant forward, her eyes caught sight of a book. She quickly read the title. Unnatural Enmities and Their Disposal, by Conrad von Holstein. She must have gasped, or betrayed some sign she was startled, for instantly Lady Dunwilliam asked, What is it, child? Nothing, ma'am. Don't lie. Was it that book? Can you read? Yes, ma'am. An unusual accomplishment for a kitchen maid. Who taught you? My mother. She was in service at Sir William Sinclair's house, and Lady Sinclair allowed her to study with the children. Lady Dunwilliam pointed to a chair. Come and sit down and bring that book with you. Harriet crept forward, clutching the book with moist hands, not at all sure she should obey. Mother had been most indignant when a milkmaid had once sat down in her presence. Besides, the invitation might be a test to see if she knew her place. Thank you, ma'am, but I'd rather. Great balls of fire, girl, sit down. Harriet perched on the very edge of the chair and waited. Open the book at page 272 her ladyship ordered. Harriet found the book almost fell open at that page. The paper was well thumbed and had quite obviously been re-read many times. Let us see how well you can read, Lady Dunwilliam invited. Harriet cleared her throat and began. Chapter 8 The Jumpity Jim We are as blind men groping in eternal darkness not knowing who or what is attendant upon us, or the pitfalls that are waiting for our stumbling feet. Many and diverse are the creatures that can be raised by those who have dipped a spoon in the unlimited sea of knowledge, but having once clothed them with a semblance of life, even the great Solomon would seek in vain for the power to control them. Let it be known to all those who would follow the path of forbidden law that there is no creature more gruesome to behold, or more hell-binding in its relationship to the flesh than the primate horrific, or, as it is known among the unlettered peasantry, the Jumpity Jim. The natural habitat of this creature is the third lower plane, and it can only be raised by a magician of the first order. But once brought into being, then I say woe well unto him who has not protected himself with the three circles of light, or cannot speak the words that are written in the blue book. It is of foul aspect, having the face and form of an unborn monkey, yet is there a fearful parody of a human in its lineaments. It can leap to great heights, and with mighty speed, and if he who has called it forth has protected himself, then it will find another. That is enough. Lady Dunwilliam's voice cut short the recital. 
You read well, child, and are a credit to your mother's tuition. Harriet gladly closed the book and looked at her employer with certain astonishment. "'Tis most fearful reading, my lady, and begging your pardon, I wonder why. Why I, inter why I interest myself in such things, Lady Dunwilliam smiled. Perhaps a crooked body breeds a crooked mind. Tis nonsense, anyway. The poor fool who wrote it had but listened to tales babbled by peasants as they huddled round their fires on a dark night. None of them know the truth, or can be expected to. She rose and made her way towards the door, talking as she went. When you have finished here, come into my withdrawing room. There is another service I require of you. It took Harriet some twenty minutes to put the rooms to rights. Then she went out on to the landing and, seeing an open door some little way along, went towards it. In the room that lay beyond she found Lady Dunwilliam seated behind a table, with a strange contraption made of polished walnut in front of her. It had a mass of wires and glass tubes rising up from its flat surface, and curving down to disappear on either side. Two perpendicular, polished metal rods were fixed to left and right at the front, while a sheet of smoked glass, set in a metal frame, made a kind of screen at the rear. "'Come sit beside me, girl,' Lady Dunwilliam ordered. "'But first remove that hideous overall, for I would see if you have the appearance for the kind of work I have in mind.' Harriet unbuttoned the offending garment and draped it carefully over a chair-back. Lady Dunwilliam was watching her with a strangely intense work. Turn round. Harriet did as she was told, turning her back to the lady, who appeared to be in a state of mounting excitement. Good white shoulders, she muttered, and a strong back. She raised her voice. Come and sit beside me. Hurry. As soon as Harriet was seated, Lady Dunwilliam pointed to the contraption and said, This was invented by Lord Dunwilliam's father, and is meant to test a person's aptitude. Beg pardon, ma'am? Great balls of fire! Lady Dunwilliam appeared to grind her teeth, but hastily regained self-control. Test your intelligence, girl. Never mind. This is what I want you to do. "'Grip those metal rods and stare straight at the glass screen. "'Now, do that.' "'Harriet, with some reluctance, gripped the metal rods as she had been bidden, "'and found they vibrated si and found they vibrated slightly. "'Lady Dunwilliam's voice was rather hoarse when she spoke again. "'Now, press them down, gently, press down gently.' Harriet felt the rods sink slowly downwards, and as she pressed them, a reddish liquid began to bubble up through the glass tubes, while the machine gave out a faint humming sound. Good, good, Lady Dunwilliam was whispering. Now, listen carefully. Stare at the glass screen and empty your mind of all thoughts. I know it is not easy, but you must be a good girl and try... Empty your mind. There are no thoughts at all. Just emptiness. Harriet found it very difficult to think of nothing at all, but Mother had taught her always to obey her elders and betters, so she tried. And as she tried, the glass tubes filled with fast-moving red liquid. The machine hummed like a kettle just on the boil, and my lady was breathing heavily. The smoked glass screen was getting bigger or so it seemed, and its surface was most certainly becoming brighter, was developing a pulsating silver sheen that would have alarmed Harriet had she not been so enthralled. Suddenly the screen cleared and became a three-dimensional picture, portraying a terrible gloomy valley, illuminated by flickering flames that flared up from the peaks of flanking mountains. The valley and mountainsides were covered with dead trees, "'twisted shapes that reached out black, skeleton arms "'towards a red-tinted sky. 
Something moved on the topmost branch of the nearest tree, a small, long-legged, long-armed something that dropped to the ground and went bounding down the valley in great, effortless jumps. It looked like a cross between a deformed monkey and a monstrous spider. But the swift, leaping jumps were its most horrible aspect. Harriet screamed as she relaxed her grip on the metal rods, and instantly the picture disappeared to be replaced by the original smoked glass. The girl was in hysterics, screaming, then laughing, and Lady Dunwilliam was clawing at her arm, slapping her face, shaking her. "'What did you see, girl? Stop it! Stop it! Tell me what you saw!' "'It was awful, ma'am!' Harriet began, then lapsed into another fit of sobbing, and my lady's patience snapped like an overstretched cord. Talk, you stupid hysterical slut! What did you see? I, I saw a, a dark valley, and— Yes, yes, go on, Lady Dunwilliam urged. There was something dreadful that went jumping. She was not allowed to continue, for Lady Dunwilliam suddenly hugged her, kissed her on both cheeks, then sat back and watched her as though she were some long-sought-for treasure that had, against all expectations, come to hand. You have it! She giggled like a very young girl and clapped her hands in an ecstasy of pure joy. The true essence! You have it! You wonderful, wonderful child! Harriet wiped her eyes, gradually coming to understand that she had recently displayed some unknown gift, or virtue, that might be to her advantage. "'Beg pardon me, lady, but what exactly have I gone?' "'Good heavens, child!' Lady Dunwilliam was looking from side to side, as though searching for a plausible explanation. "'You have intelligence and imagination. The aptitude machine demonstrated that beyond all doubt. Who but a very intelligent and imaginative girl could have created a dark valley and a funny little thing that jumped up and down on a piece of ordinary smoked glass? I am very pleased with you, my dear. Thank you, ma'am. Harriet blushed with pleasure. I have been looking for a suitable companion with whom I can converse, Lady Dunwilliam went on, for... As you can see, I lead a very lonely life, and really I see no reason why you should not fill the post. What do you say to that? Oh, my lady, Harriet began, but Lady Dunwilliam cut short her thanks with an imperious wave of her hand. That's settled, then. There's a nice little room next to mine, and you might as well move in right away. "'What will my duties be?' Harriet asked. "'Duties?' Lady Dunwilliam appeared to be at a loss for words for a short while, then, as though struck by a sudden thought, said, "'Reading. You may read to me and keep my rooms tidy.' "'I will endeavour to give satisfaction, ma'am,' said Harriet. "'For no apparent reason,' Lady Dunwilliam suddenly began to laugh. Youth is adaptable, and Harriet soon got used to doing practically nothing at all. That is not to say her erstwhile companions of servitude either accepted the situation or failed to show their shocked surprise. Whenever Lady Dunwilliam was out of sight and earshot, Harriet was winked at, sneered at, scowled upon, pinched, kicked, and on one occasion punched in the ribs by Mary, who seemed to regard her as a deserter. She was also envied, and by those who said they knew more than they were prepared to reveal, pitied. One morning, while dusting the china in Lady Dunwilliam's withdrawing-room, she looked up to find Mrs. Browning staring at her with cold, expressionless eyes. "'Do you know why her ladyship has taken you to her bosom, girl?' "'She required a companion,' 
Harriet stated boldly, for of late a feeling of self-confidence had moved in with the pretty dresses and her mistress's constant esteem. One out of ten poor relations would have filled the post, Mrs. Browning retorted with a sound that was as near a snort as was possible to a person of her demeanour. "'Tis no affair of mine, but pride goes before a fall, and I've not walked about with closed eyes and blocked ears these past ten years. Do you say your prayers at night? Of course, Harriet expressed surprise at the question. Good, Mrs. Browning nodded. I would say them at twilight, just before the sun sets, for it's said the good Lord is most receptive, then. Another thing, she paused in the doorway. I wouldn't go roaming around on the top landing after nightfall. It was there, in the locked room, up under the roof, his late lordship, may his soul rest in peace, used to conduct his experiments, whatever they were. They still talk in the village about the horrible cries that could be heard a mile away. There's no servants left that was here then, and that's a fact a sensible girl would think about. So watch yourself. Wear a crucifix, keep what I've said under your bonnet, and think about it. Such revelations were as stones thrown into a placid pool. They caused unpleasant ripples of alarm, but then, warmed by Lady Dunwilliam's affability, well fed, comfortably bedded, and with no arduous toil to mar her days, the feeling of well-being soon returned to Harriet. So pleasantly, in fact, did the days pass, she quite forgot there was such a person as Lord Dunwilliam, and therefore it came as a shock when she entered the withdrawing-room one morning, with her arms full of flowers, to find him seated in an armchair, his dusty boots propped up on a small table. He eyed Harriet with some surprise, then raised a slim eyebrow. "'The damsel in distress. You appear to have made yourself at home?' Harriet curtsied and almost dropped her flowers in the process. "'Her lady, she said I was to be her companion.' Lord Dunwilliam seemed to uncoil like a handsome snake. He towered over her his eyes suddenly alight with a gleam of dawning joy. "'She made you her companion. Well, that is marvellous news.' Harriet had not thought his lordship would greet her elevation with anything but complete indifference. But here he was displaying all the emotion of a man who has been told he has just inherited a large fortune. He seized her roughly by the shoulder, kissed her soundly on both cheeks, then rushed from the room and tore upstairs. For the first time she experienced a cold wave of apprehension. She remembered the story Hackett had related, Mrs. Browning's sinister warning. Why should Lord Dunwilliam express undisguised joy when he learned the kitchen-maid had been promoted to lady's companion? What should have been an unthinkable thought struck her. Was she to play Hagar to Lady Dunwilliam's Sarah? The idea was extremely sinful, and she decided not to think about it. Instead, she went upstairs to her bedroom, where she sat by the window and looked out over the garden. Jem was pruning roses. A tall, ungainly figure who looked solid and matter-of-fact. A man of the soil. The kind of person Harriet had known all her life. She was about to go down and speak with him when she heard raised voices. They came from behind the closed door, which led into Lady Dunwilliam's bedroom. The deep voice of Lord Dunwilliam was quite distinct, that of his wife a blurred murmur. But Harriet felt sure it was of the uttermost importance for her to hear as much of their conversation as possible. She bent down and applied her ear to the keyhole. His lordship was striding up and down, clearly much agitated. Lady Dunwilliam reclined in a chair and was tapping the palm of her hand with an ivory fan, as though stressing her impatience. "'Are you absolutely certain?' Lord Dunwilliam was speaking. "'You know what happened last time.' 
Harriet could not hear her ladyship's answer. Then the man spoke again. We must get her accustomed to the idea, God knows how. She seems simple, and perhaps money and the promise of a life of ease might reconcile her. We can but try. There must be no talk. That mad fool Dale is already shouting witchcraft at the top of his voice. If he were to know the truth. The lady began to cry, and Dunwilliam was about to put his arm around her shoulders, but, as though repulsed by the hideous hump, took one of her hands instead. Harriet stood up, then walking over to the window, looked down at Jem, still peacefully pruning his roses. "'How long have I been here?' Jem sat on his wheelbarrow and lit an old clay pipe. "'Well, now, let me think. Must be nigh on eight year, just after old Sir Harry Sinclair died. I heard his lordship was in need of an head gardener, so here I comes.' "'Was Lord Dunwilliam married eight years ago?' Harriet asked, tapping her front teeth with a rose stem. "'That he were,' Jem nodded, "'and had been for two years. "'Poor lady must be cruel hard for her being afflicted the way she is, "'especially with that pretty face. "'His lordship must be a very kind man,' Harriet spoke with assumed artlessness. "'I mean, it's not every great gentleman who would marry a cripple.' "'I guess he'd be kind enough,' Jem agreed. "'But they do say she weren't a hunchback when he married her. "'Sweet sixteen she were, and as straight as a larch. "'Some sickness took her after they'd been married nigh on a month, "'and when she was up and about she were as you see her now.' "'No,' Harriet gasped. "'Honestly?' "'So they say.' "'Mind you, that was way back in the old master's time, "'and there be no servants here now that were there then. "'But it sounds right. "'I can't see her up and buckle like his lordship marrying Ampy. "'Must have been a sickness affected her spine. "'Made it all crooked-like. "'Harriet agreed and wondered if the sickness were catching. "'They dined together that evening. "'Lord Dunwilliam sat at one end of the table, his lady at the other, and Harriet in the centre, while the pleasantly shocked footman relayed news of this startling arrangement back to the kitchen. "'She looks very pretty, does she not, Charles?' said Lady Dunwilliam, and the gentleman nodded as he sipped his port wine. "'As a picture that has escaped from its frame. What white shoulders!' Her ladyship laughed so joyfully, and looked so beautiful, one was inclined to forget the awful hump, and Lord Dunwilliam chuckled as though she had said something very witty. "'With a strong back to support them,' he nodded gravely. "'A veritable column of ivory.' This was too much for her ladyship, who shook with helpless merriment, so that the hump seemed to jump up and down, and her face was a mask with narrowed, gleaming eyes and a gaping mouth. Then, suddenly, the laughter was strangled by a gasp of pain, and the lady was bending forward, shaking her golden head, while making a series of animal-like cries. Lord Dunwilliam sat back in his chair, and closed eyes that were bleak. His voice was scarcely above a whisper. "'Sit still, my darling. It will pass.' "'What is wrong?' Harriet's pity was aroused as also was her alarm, for her mistress seemed to be in mortal agony, what with the terrible groans that were being forced out from behind her clenched teeth, and the way her long fingers gripped the table edge. "'Is there aught I can do?' Lord Dunwilliam sat perfectly still, his eyes still closed, but the ghost of a smile creased his mouth. "'Nothing, child. Tis but a gripping pain.' The spasm passed as quickly as it had come, and presently Lady Dunwilliam was smiling faintly, apologising for the alarm she had caused. "'Do not be frightened, my dear. I have these attacks if I get excited. I should never become excited.' "'It must be soon,' Lord Dunwilliam said, and his lady nodded. "'Aye, it must be soon.' If I am to remain sane, it must be soon. 
A day passed. You will wear this. Lady Dunwilliam's eyes were bright, and her hand shook as she tossed the dress onto the bed. Harriet said, Yes, ma'am, thank you, ma'am. And, Lady Dunwilliam added, You will wear nothing underneath. But, my lady, Harriet gasped out her horror, "'Twould not be decent. Great balls of fire! An expression of anger passed over the beautiful face. I am not concerned with your opinion of decency. I said you are to wear nothing, nothing underneath. But, ma'am, a tinge of colour tinged Harriet's pale cheeks, I am a respectable girl. Lady Dunwilliam gripped the girl by both shoulders and shook her until her head rocked. Listen, girl, listen. I have put up with your simpering face for nigh on four weeks. I have pampered you. Listened to your childish prattle, and now you will do as I say, or by God's wounds I'll have his lordship strip you himself. Do you understand? Harriet was crying, sobbing so that her body trembled like a wind-rocked tree, and so great was her fear she could only gasp, Yes, my lady. Very well, Lady Dunwilliam went to the door. We will come for you in ten minutes. Left alone, Harriet reluctantly disrobed, then put on the dress, her horror growing when she viewed herself in the wardrobe mirror. The dress was black and completely backless. She turned round and looked back over one shoulder, her back, save for a tape that held the dress in position, was bare from neck to waist. She ran to the door, pulled it open and went racing down the stairs, determined to take refuge in the kitchen, trusting that Mrs. Browning or some of the servants would protect her from the madness of Lady Dunwilliam. The kitchen was empty. The fire was out, all the saucepans were piled neatly on their racks, the doors and windows were locked. She called Mrs. Browning's name, and receiving no answer, went tearing up the stairs to the servants' quarters. She flung doors open, scampering like a trapped animal from room to room, but there was no one. Terror came racing down the empty corridors, and she screamed, shriek after shriek that gave birth to an army of mocking echoes, like cries of the damned when the lid of hell has been raised. She fled back through the echoes, stumbling down one flight of stairs, fell down the next, picked herself up, then tore out into the main hall. The great front doors were locked, and she pounded on the unresponsive wood, tugged at the gleaming handle, then sank down to the floor, sobbing like an abandoned child. Footsteps came over the paved floor, a shadow moved over her, and she looked up into the face of Lord Dunwilliam. Never had he appeared more beautiful. A wonderful gleam of compassion softened his sombre eyes, making him the lover-father, the dream-master who would love and chastise, order and protect. He reached down and pulled her up, then held her to him, murmuring softly, She should not have been so cruel. There now, don't cry so. She does not mean to hurt you, but it has been such a long time. Think of it. Ten long years. She was younger than you when it happened, and she was so sweet, soft and gentle, and so very, very beautiful. Please, my lord, let me go. Harriet felt sure. When she looked up into that beautiful, kindly face, her request would be granted, but he shook his head while he smoothed back the tumbled hair from her forehead. "'I can't do that, child. You must surely understand that. I love her. Love demands so much. Honour, pity, the common decencies that enable a man to walk upright under the sun.' All of these must be sacrificed when the one we cherish cries out for help. You do see. 
I'm so frightened, Harriet said as he began to lead her across the hall and up the grand staircase. Please, I'm frightened. Lord Dunwilliam had an arm about her waist, and he held her left hand in his. The deep voice went on, carefully manufacturing words that had no meaning. One can learn to live with fear, so that after a while it is as natural as the air we breathe. Resignation and acceptance are the two words you must learn. Then, when you carry your burden through the darkest valley, there will always be a gleam of light ahead. They went up two flights of stairs, then began to ascend a third, and Harriet started to struggle. But the iron grip tightened around her waist, and the deep voice gently protested. Do not struggle, my little bird. You will only break your wings against the bars, and you must not waste your strength. See, there is but a short way to go, and my love is waiting for you. They came up on to the top landing, and there, like the mouth of a ravenous beast, was an open doorway. He led the now speechless girl into the room beyond, and after seating her on a straight-backed chair, he went back and locked the door. The room was little more than a vast attic that possibly covered most of the rooms below. Above were cobweb-festooned rafters supporting the roof. Dormer windows lined the walls on either side. Glass vats, jumbled heaps of wire and glass tubes littered the floor, and there were signs of a long-ago fire, for some of the rafters and floorboards were charred. The only furniture Harriet could see was a large table and a few wooden chairs. Lady Dunwilliam came slowly forward, her burning stare fixed on the girl's white face. She wore a loose, flower-patterned dressing-gown, and her hair was piled up high on her head. No delay, she spat the words. Let's get on with it. No, her husband's voice was like a whip-crack. No, she must be prepared. Was I? The woman glared at him, hammering her hips with clenched fists. When your father trapped me, was I prepared? He but led me under that rafter. She pointed to a charred beam, tore the dress from my back, and— Stop! Lord Dunwilliam thundered. She is young and untutored. What was I? Lady Dunwilliam shrieked back. A mature woman of the world? I was sixteen, fresh from the schoolroom, and happy to have suddenly acquired a kind father and a handsome husband. Father? She laughed, a mad shriek that made Harriet whimper. A devil incarnate, a monster. He but sought knowledge, Lord Dunwilliam murmured. He followed the dark path, and found it had no end. Lady Dunwilliam sank down onto a chair and lowered her head. Tell her what you must, she said in a low tone. But in the name of mercy, hurry. Lord Dunwilliam took up a small black book from the table and handed it to Harriet. She recognized the title. Unnatural Enmities and Their Disposal by Conrad von Holstein. My wife tells me you can read, Harriet. She nodded. Now... I want you to turn to page 273 and read from the top of the page. Will you do that? Yes, she whimpered. Very well. Begin when you are ready. She turned over the yellow-edged pages and presently came to the place. The page stared up at her, the words mutely demanding a voice. She began to read. The primate horrific, or jumpity Jim, hath little intelligence, being but a form of low existence that doth demand life essence and warm blood. Once it hath been raised, it will leap about with much speed and agility, and if that which it needs be not to hand will depart with a mighty explosion. But should there be within the radius of twenty feet a virgin who hath the right essence 
and should the flesh of her back, that which lies between the neck and the upper portion of the loins, be bare, then it will leap thereon and will become, as part of the poor wretch, as doth the legs and other members that did God in his bountiful goodness provide. Once the abomination has mounted the steed, it can in no wise be removed unless a like virgin, cursed with the same essence, can be induced or forced to accept the loathsome burden. That is enough, Harriet. Lord Dunwilliam gently took the book from her limp hands and laid it on the table. She raised tear-filled eyes. Never had he seemed so handsome, so kind. You have the right essence, my dear. The instrument my father perfected told us that. You are also a virgin, or the glass screen would not have portrayed the dark valley. Twas our wedding eve when my father— But enough of that. You do understand what is expected of you? No, she shook her head violently. In God's name, no! There is no other way, his gentle voice insisted, for we have searched for so long. One girl had a little power, and it did move, causing my wife much pain and injuring the girl. But you are the one. For you, the transportation will be easy, and there will be a life of ease for you and your parents, for as long as any of you live. Harriet could not speak. She was watching Lady Dunwilliam, who was unfastening her robe, loosening the girdle all the while smiling like one who has at last seen the gates of heaven through the smoke-clouds of purgatory. The robe fell to the floor, and she was as Venus in her naked glory, a vision of white curves and moulded breasts. Then she turned round, and Harriet started to scream, but her vocal cords refused to function. A hump? A promontory? A protuberance? rather a curvature that arched up from the base of her spine, then terminated in a kind of craggy ridge which unnaturally deepened the thickness of the shoulders. Come, Lord Dunwilliam pulled Harriet to her feet. You must stand side by side. No, she screamed, and his face grew grim. No! Do not force me to tie you down. The threat did much to command her obedience for there was an added terror to the thought of being tied up, helpless, while something leapt upon her. She allowed him to lead her, unprotesting, to Lady Dunwilliam's side. Flinched as a cold hand gripped hers, then she stood still and waited. Lord Dunwilliam took up a position in front of them, and after closing his eyes began to chant a jumble of words. From far below there came the sound of splintering wood, but the three occupants of the room ignored it. Darkness, shadows that flow in a black stream, hear me. May that which feeds upon one come forth and take nourishment from another. May that which has come from the nether world and can never return, having taken on the flesh of the meat-eater, see the light of day and jump upon the waiting vessel. Aye, upon the waiting vessel, Lady Dunwilliam repeated. She is young and hath much strength, Lord Dunwilliam raised his voice to a higher pitch, and she hath the right essence. Lady Dunwilliam began to writhe and moan. Her grip tightened on Harriet's hand, so that the girl automatically turned as the sudden pain shot up her arm. The hump was moving. The skin was heaving. Tremors were passing across the taut surface, and on the crag-like ridge, Little eruptions were taking place. Small, ragged holes appeared, accompanied by little popping sounds. The voice of Lord Dunwilliam had a triumphant ring. The shoulders are white, ay, and the back is strong. The blood is thick and sweet, and she is rich with essence. The skin split while Lady Dunwilliam screamed, and a tiny, wizened head peeped out from its cocoon, like a chick about to emerge from its cracked egg. It was rather like a shriveled pink balloon, and it jerked round to stare at Harriet with microscopic red eyes. 
The girl gave a hoarse cry and jerked her hand from Lady Dunwilliam's loosened grip, before tearing wildly across the room in an effort to escape. As she did so, the woman was flung onto her face, while something went leaping up to the rafters, then down to the floor again. A black, pink-tinted something that moved so fast, it was only a blur that streaked up and down across the room. With her back against the far wall, Harriet saw it zigzagging towards her, coming forward with high leaps that carried it up to the rafters and down again. Then there was a glimpse of that wizened, deflated face, the long pink body and four many-jointed legs. Before she seized a nearby chair and hurled it straight at the approaching horror, chair and thing collided with what appeared to be a pink ball. Chair and thing collided, and what appeared to be a pink ball went rolling over the floor to bounce against the nearest wall. It lay there, a pulsating beach ball, artistically striped with black, where the legs were coiled tightly about its gleaming roundness, and it began to rock slightly, as though gathering momentum for another leap. Lord Dunwilliam had laid his wife flat upon her back before dragging her under the table, where she lay moaning softly. He turned to Harriet and shouted his rage and fear. "'You must let it mount! Otherwise it will go back to her! There is no door or wall that can hold it!' His words were cut short by a sudden and violent interruption. The door first quivered, then splintered under a powerful blow. A second crash sent it hurling inwards, and the Reverend Dale stood on the threshold a thick beam of wood in one hand and a crucifix in the other. He was attired in a white surplice and a ferocious smile. Don William, the day of reckoning has come. He advanced into the room the crucifix held high. Ye have mocked and practised abominations, but hell is hungry for your soul, and I have come to make an end. I. He tilted his head to one side and glared down at Harriet. "'An end to you, and the foulness that has assumed a human form.' Don William faced him, a thoroughbred stallion squaring up to a mad bull. "'Get out! This is not the place for a ranting insane fool. You have not the slightest conception of what—' "'I have eyes!' The priest pointed to the naked form of Lady Don William, then at Harriet. "'They tell me all I wish to know.' "'When you sent your servants packing for the day, "'where did you suppose they would go, eh? "'To the village, where they prattled of the foulness "'you be practising with yon wench. "'You are cursed, Dunwilliam, "'you and your devil-bedded wife.' "'Dunwilliam struck the white face, "'then gripped the not-so-white surplice "'and punched the priest about the body, "'all the while shouting obscenities, "'bellowing out his mad rage.' As the Reverend Dale struggled violently, there came the sound of ripping cloth, and he went hurtling backwards, the surplice split from neck to waist, bearing his scrawny back. Don William retreated a few paces and looked down at his falling adversary. A look of indescribable horror was dawning on the clergyman's face, a stupefied glare. His mouth fell open, and a gurgling, retching sound emerged from his constricted throat. It slowly and painfully dissolved into words. What foul thing is on my back? He came up from the floor like a boxer at the count of nine. His questing hands went back and gently caressed that which crouched on his shoulders. He quickly withdrew them, then stared at his moist fingers with an uncomprehending glare. When he spoke again, his voice was a low, hoarse whisper. "'I say again, Dunwilliam, what foul thing is on my back?' Dunwilliam began to laugh. He roared, slapped his thighs, shook with uncontrollable merriment, while tears ran down his cheeks. Harriet could only watch the jumpety Jim. It was perfectly at home on the reverend's back. The head was nestling sideways, a little below Mr. Dale's neck. The legs were folded neatly under the pink, narrow torso, 
and a slimy excrescence oozing out from every part of the body was rapidly congealing into a chalk white skin. Lord Dunwilliam at last gave utterance. Your holiness has condemned you. A virgin, a virgin whose flesh is bare from neck to waist. What in God's name is it? Dale was trying to shake his dreadful burden off. He twisted, jerked, then gasped when the creature tightened its hold. You must not get excited, Don William warned. It's a primate horrific, a jumpety Jim, he grinned. I should take it to a monastery. It will find many changes of abode there. The Reverend Dale backed away towards the door, then, after vainly trying to speak, turned and went staggering out onto the landing. They heard him stumbling down the stairs. Five minutes passed before Harriet's strength returned, and she too was able to creep from that room of horror. She left Lord Dunwilliam holding his wife and rocking her gently. They were both laughing softly. Down on the lawn they were waiting. Terrified men with blazing torches, and they shrank from the Reverend Mr. Dale as though he were a leper. One man, braver than his fellows, approached the hump-backed figure and asked in a strangled voice, "'What is it?' The clergyman grinned, a terrible baring of teeth, and he beckoned the man nearer. "'Are you a virgin?' he whispered. "'Eh? Are you a virgin? If so, take off your shirt and we'll dance a merry jig.' The man retreated, murmuring, Witchcraft. They have bewitched him and put the devil on his back. Witchcraft! The word leapt from mouth to mouth as they moved with uplifted torches towards the house. Harriet they spat at, beat about the face and back, before she managed to escape from the garden and ran out to the dusty road that led to the village. When she walked over the narrow bridge she did not look down into the dark waters of the river and did not therefore see the figure of Mr. Dale floating, face downwards. She did, however, look back and see great scarlet tongues trying to lick the steel-blue sky. Dunwilliam Grange was burning. She went on down the road, a pathetic, bowed figure, wandering the short but perilous path that separates the cradle from the grave. Her white back gleamed in the sunlight. A little way back, Something was zigzagging across a meadow, leaping over hedges, swinging from the lower branches of an occasional tree. It came to a gate that barred the entrance to a dusty road. There it paused. The deflated, wizened head tilted to one side. Tired, hesitant footsteps came shuffling along the road. They passed the gate and went on, behind a low hawthorn hedge.